get to watch how to put on a tablecloth. The guy over there signed me up, so you yell at him.
light up or anything? There we go. All right. So thanks for everyone coming out here tonight. Uh, I'm Joey Antonelli, for those of you who don't know me, uh, whether you've seen me on the YouTube stuff or just around fishing. Uh, we're going to go over a few, uh, few of the fishing styles that I like to do and what seems to kind of get the most interest uh, from a lot of the anglers out there. First, since it's winter time, we're going to start with pompano fishing because that's what's happening right now and you can take that and go do it when it's not freezing and super windy. Uh, the pompano fishing I do is mostly from the surf without a boat and fishing whether it's sand fleas, clams, shrimp, um, just getting the whole spread out there and looking for those pompano. Uh, a lot of the stuff that goes into pompano fishing for me is the networking is the biggest thing. You can look at water temps, you can look at tides, you can say when the fish should be there, but this year has been evidence that you can't do that. Because I know it's been a really, really weird pompano season, at least up by me, about an hour and a half up the road. And I've heard the same thing down here also. The fish should be here really thick, and they're not. Um, when I'm pompano fishing, I want to use a rod where I can cast really far out because you can always use that rod and cast it shorter if you need to, but you can't take that little seven foot inshore rod and get out to that second bar. And when I'm talking about that second bar, I'm talking about the second sandbar out there. Something like this. And this, these, uh, this is the Trophy 2, this is the Airwave. Airwave's a little nicer, lighter setup. Uh, it's gonna give you the range you need to get out really far, and they're rated for some heavier weights, like a three ounce, four ounce, five ounce lead for the days when it's gonna be a little rougher out there. Um, I usually pair with it like a 5,000, 6,000 size reel, and not because you need the power, but it's gonna give you, when the line comes off the reel, it's gonna come off nice and smooth and let you get really far cast out there. Uh, the rigs for pompano, I think is, besides getting to actually the area where the pompano are with the cast, the rigs makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, I'm strictly fishing fluorocarbon for pompano. Either, don't tell those guys about that. 12 footers, yeah, 12 footers. Yeah, uh, yeah, these are both 12 footers and I have an 11 footer I use also, and that's kind of more just throwing it in short. Um, when you first start start out the morning, sometimes the fish will be in close. So I don't bomb, I fish four rods. I would say most people probably, you probably want to fish at least two rods uh, and stagger the distance unless you really start to dial in in a certain area where the fish are. Uh, you can see the sandbars by where the waves are breaking, or even if the waves aren't breaking, where the wave starts to peak up a little bit. That wave is gonna peak up the highest or break at the shallowest spot, whether it's the outside sandbar, or maybe it's not even breaking on that, and then on the inside sandbar, you'll see it peak up again. Uh, sometimes I'll get right on top of the outside sandbar, but usually I like to be just inside or just outside. A lot of times right on the sandbar, especially if there's a lot of wave action, a lot of white water, don't really tend to get bit as much in that area. Uh, but I want to show you the rigs that we're using. So I actually just picked up a surf fishing wallet. Super nice and organized. Tie up all your rigs at home because the rigs take a while to tie up. Uh, I'm using 30 pound, 20 to 30 pound fluorocarbon. And I use three hook rigs where at the very bottom, it's essentially a big chicken rig. Um, at the bottom you have a snap swivel, and then you're gonna have a couple loops coming off it, either two or three loops, depending on how many uh, how many hooks you want. It's a, it's a dropper rig. So when you tie it, you're gonna have a loop form like that. I cut one end of the loop, so now instead of having two pieces of line coming off with a loop, you just have one piece and you tie the hook on there. So if you're using 20 pound, but you have it in the loop, you got two pieces of 20 pound there, which is, I mean, really as thick as 40 pounds sitting in front of the fish's face. So cut the loop, tie the hook on instead of looping it on, and it's going to give you a really, really clean look for that uh, pompano rig. We're going to show you how that's already untangled. This one has definitely seen some fish. You can tell by the flow 
boats on there. Uh, on my rigs, again, you gotta see what's happening for the day. But generally speaking, the top hook, I put a big float on. The middle hook, I put a smaller float on. And the bottom hook, I don't put any float on, either like a little bead or just a bare hook. And the reason I do that is the bottom hook is gonna be the lowest to the sand and I want that length down a little bit. Looking for the whiting or something cruising the bottom or even a permit or a pompano or permit if it's rutting around real low. The float is gonna float the bait up high. So I kind of try to stagger it and hit the whole water column. And you gotta think when your bait's in the water, it's not like this because you're standing 150 yard or 150 feet back. So it's gonna be angled really really low to the ground that first one may only may be touching the sand the next one might be six inches up the next one might be a foot or foot and a half up it's not going to be straight up and down uh, and you want your rig to stay still if there's if there's heavy current you can use something like these spudnik weights if you've ever seen something like this uh, they're pretty cool design they cast insanely well they hold insanely well until you no longer need them to they have these wires uh, once you, they anchor it in the sand, then once you pull hard, it snaps the wires down and then it drags in nice and easy. Uh, if it's not really strong current, you don't need a really strong let. You can use just your regular pyramid sinkers. I do not go less than a four ounce. Even if there's no waves, it's flat calm and the fish are pretty close in and I don't need the distance, I still go with a four ounce. And that's because when you're fishing for pompano, you usually have your rod sitting in a spike, sitting in a sand spike on the beach and you're just waiting. You might be working on another rod, changing the bait, doing something. When that fish hits, you want a weight heavy enough to set that circle hook for you. So if you're not around it and you have a little one ounce lead, the fish might grab it, drag it a little bit, know something's wrong and then let go. Where with the four ounce lead or a spudnik lead, when that fish goes to run, that lead's not going to move anywhere near as easily, and that's your hook set right there. The fish is set before you even pick the rod up. And all I use is circle hooks. I don't use the... Yeah? For the size hook, what size hook? I use uh, a circle hook in the 1 or 1.0 one size. Um, I like the VMC. I don't remember the model. The VMC, the owner moved too light, and then VMC makes a hook that looks very similar. It's a circle hook that has a little bit of offset. Uh, they're black. I know uh, Laser Laser Sharp makes a silver hook. It's a little bit of a thicker thicker gauge wire, though. I like the real thin gauge, uh, like Mutu Lights by Owner or the VMC version of that. Because it's not a very strong fish or not a very heavy fish. You don't need the tackle. You're using these giant setups, not for the fish, just to get to where the fish is. You could land the fish on pretty much any tackle, and it's it is a it's a finesse game when reeling them in because you have these little teeny 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 hooks and it's with a big old rod like that it is really easy to size that curly tail it is really easy to pull hooks uh the way i fight the fish it's steady i don't pump i just keep the rod tip pointed down at the fish and just keep turning the handle not down down but i'm not holding the rod straight up i just keep the rods down and pompano a lot of the time they run sideways so you it's almost a dead giveaway between pompano and whiting whiting almost like like a red redfish where it's real hard head shakes uh, and mostly coming straight in sometimes you'll get them where they run sideways but those pompano I mean, they might hit it hard and run hard right away but then a lot of the fight is just a sideways walk down the beach and you're dodging your other rods going over under seeing how they need to move and i just reel real steady and then when they get in close that's usually where you lose the fish if you're gonna lose them, because that's when they freak out. It's like they don't want to come over that last bar, that last little sandbar right there. And that's where they run real hard. And I like having the long 12 foot rod, because you can, you don't really need to rely on the drag or anything like that. The fish isn't really gonna pull drag, but at the same time, you don't want to rip the hook out of its lip. So when it pulls hard, just kind of like parking style, like bow to it a little bit. Even though it's a little one pound, one and a half, two, three pound fish, Move that rod tip down a foot or two and it'll really help you from uh, pulling hooks on those fish. Let's see. Uh, baits that I use, my all-time favorite bait is live sand flea. Uh, the blanched sand fleas work very well also. A blanched sand flea is a boiled sand flea. You, you boil them before you freeze them. It uh, makes it so you know, that you can actually freeze the bait and it's good when you thaw it out. I think blanched sand fleas actually catch more fish, 
but they also fall apart a little bit more so you can't cast them as hard as you can a live sand flea. If the fish are far out or you're fishing from the surf, the live sand flea just stays on there really, really well. Uh, but it's a good idea to have a, a little variety of bait too, whether it's clams or shrimp or uh, even one of the one of the fake baits like the either fish gum or the fish bites that come in all sorts of different flavors and colors. Um, like that's sand flea sickle right there. They all work, they all work really well on their own day. Uh, floats, floats are fun. I, I know they make a difference as far as colors go because there's been times when I'm getting them on a white float or I'm getting them on a pink float more. But they're just fun to, they're fun to play with. Make yourself a little tackle box like this. Whenever you go to go in the shop, check out uh, whatever floats they have. Pick out a variety, and that's, you have one box that stays home. This never comes to the beach with you. Maybe make a smaller box that has a few of them. That's the real pretty box that stays home. And then you bring the rigs to the beach that are already tied up. You can order those little baggies online. You buy a hundred of them, it's like five bucks or something like that. So do as much work as you can at home and uh, get everything prepped. Uh, another thing I see that I would probably say is one of the biggest errors in surf fishing is letting the rod soak for too long. If you're not getting a bite, I set, I check my all my rods, all four rods will not sit out for more than 10 minutes. If I don't get a bite, I'll reel them in and more often than not either you know, got pecked off by little croakers or crabs chewed them up. That's why these floats are, I mean that used to be about double the size and it's completely crushed from crabs holding onto the float while it's eating the bait. They, and you won't see that. You won't see that on the rod tip. They'll just take all your bait and then you got, you're waiting there for 20 minutes and you don't have any bait in the water. So when I fish four rods, by the time I bait and cast out the fourth one, it's pretty much time to reel in the first one and start the whole process over again. Um, and that makes a huge difference there doing that. Uh, any questions on, on the whole surf fishing thing? Okay, we're gonna stay on the beach, but now we're gonna go to something I think is a lot more fun. I'm not picking that one up anymore. And that's the, the surf fishing more in the summertime or the tarpon, the snook. Uh, that is hands down probably my favorite fishery. It's an easy fishery, uh, easy meaning you don't need a boat, you don't need all this crazy fancy gear. All you need is a couple lures, a rod, or even just some live bait, and uh, you can go get it done. When I'm doing the snook fishing, which is something I do a lot all summer long, I like to go a couple different ways with it. You don't need a big rod, you don't need a heavy rod. Uh, it's a lot of fun on like a three to 4,000 size reel. This one here, this is the Salt X 4000 on the Carpy Shield Fast Action, the seven foot six. Uh, it's a real flexy rod and it makes the, if you're snook fishing in the summertime, the only reason you're doing it is because you love snook fishing, it's fun. If you just want to land your fish and it, it's not the right time of year to do it because you can't keep them anyway, so you might as well have fun when you're doing it. Um, and this is pretty much the exact setup I'll use. I got 20 pound braid on there to 30 pound uh, fluorocarbon leader and I like J-hooks. I like J-hooks for a couple of reasons when snook fishing on the beach. Uh, we'll go over that in a second. But the bait of choice for me in the summertime is either like a white bait, like a filtered or a thread fin, or a croaker. And sometimes, everyone always thinks croakers are the best bait. It's not necessarily true, but they do work really, really well, especially in the summertime. Uh, I fish them really close in. I'm flipping them just right in the trough there. If you, uh, if you've ever seen any of the aerial stuff from like the drones, can't fly a drone more than a hundred foot down the beach in the morning without seeing a couple of stuff. They're just three fish here, three fish here, three fish here. It's their spawning time. They gather on the beaches. A lot of those fish move out of the inlets, move out of the river onto the beaches. And they're just an awesome snook fishery all summer long. Uh, same thing with the fil filters all nose hook, thread fins all nose hook. Croakers are pretty much the only thing I, I hook them in the tail. And the reason I do this is you hook them in the tail, just flip them out right there. And I fish them with an open bale with just enough tension on them to make them mad, to really slow them down and make them freak out. And you'll know before you get hit every time. That fish will just give it one more look. When it sees that snook, I mean, it feels like it gets thumped. It'll pull it off your finger if you're holding the line there. You think you got a fish, you'll hold tight and it's just that bait freaking out. Uh, but that is an insanely fun fishery. Uh, if you are more of a artificial type of person, like throwing artificial, you can get them 
all times of the day, but really for me, I, I only really do well in the snook in the summertime on artificial, either in the morning or the evening, unless there's some kind of bait around and you can see them actively feeding. Uh, for that sort of thing, I like a bigger bait. I usually throw something at least like five inches or so. Uh, well, these I was gonna show you for tarpon, but the seven inch swim shad, I've definitely done really well on those. They have an insanely strong hook. Uh, not a huge deal for snook because you're not going to bend too many hooks fishing snook on the beach. But those work really well, along with a lot of the stuff in here. Uh, you probably got some of this stuff already. One of my favorite plugs is the Mag Garter. Works insanely well. It dives deep though. If you're fishing a beach with reef, I know you guys have a lot of reef down here. This thing will dive, I think it'll dive up to six feet. So if you really slow, it does float though. So if you slow down your retrieve, uh, just throw it out there and you don't throw it straight out because the fish are usually really close. Stand on the beach and throw it like a 30 degree angle. Just throw down that trough and reel it in real slow. You can even feel it bouncing off the bottom. If you're on a sandy beach, something like that's really good. But if you have reef, you might want to stick with the, the swim baits or you got like the hoagies or the spool text, something like that that has the hook up top. That way if you bounce off a rock, there's a good chance you're not going to snag the rock and you can keep doing that. Uh, flare hawks will work on the beach also. Not really my favorite thing to fish for the summertime snook. Uh, I just do a swim bait, steady retrieve. I don't twitch it, I don't do anything. Just a slow, steady retrieve on the swim baits. And those tend to, those are my favorite artificials to fish in the summertime. But I would take live bait fishing any day. Cause you can, you can go out at noon. You can go out at noon, you can go out any time of the day. And if, if those snook are around and they're not disturbed, if there's not like a bunch of swimmers in the water, They'll usually eat. They'll usually eat a croaker. They'll usually eat a filter. And I do better the dirtier the water, the better I normally do. You guys get some pretty clean water down here in the summertime. You can't get the fish to eat. It might be a morning or evening thing. Just because the light, they might be seeing, maybe they're seeing your leader. You could drop down to 25 or 20 pound. Um, but that's a, that's a really, really fun fishery. For the hooks, if you're fishing those croakers, when you tail hook a croaker, that's a lot of meat between the tip of your hook and that snook's mouth. You gotta pretty much do a hook set hard enough to rip that croaker off your hook. And I use the, uh, the owner six O's or five O's and they're cutting points. They're not, uh, what the cutting point is is that it, it, it's at an angle. It's not like a real smooth, like ballpoint pen style. It's uh, got a cutting point. It works really, really, really well. Um, yeah, if I'm setting the hook on a fish, these are the hooks I'm using for the for the bigger baits. Um, with the pilchards, the croaker wants to swim down. So you don't, unless you have big surf, you don't need any kind of weight. The croaker wants to get down right where those snook are. The snook are pretty much on the bottom. If you're fishing a pilchard, just the variety of little pinch weights. Anything from, that's about a half ounce, I would say. I wouldn't go any heavier than that, unless it's really windy and you need to cast out further. And even go as light as just the little teeny, little teeny BB weights, so something like that. It might not get it to the bottom, but it's gonna make that pilcher swim like there's something wrong with it. And that really tends to get their attention. About what? Yeah. Okay, let's find the... different ways to tail hook a bait. We'll sacrifice a swim bait for it. Um, in the back, pretty much straight above where the anal fin, there'll be a fin right down here, straight above it on the top of the back. I go there a lot and when you pull, it's going to aim the fish's head down. So when you pull down, it, or when you give it a little, that little bit of resistance by keeping your hand aligned, that croaker is going to keep swimming down. Uh, another way I'll do it, I will hook him in the tail also on the bottom, right above the anal fin. That's a tougher section of meat though. It's a lot harder to pull your hook out there. You tend to miss more baits. I think the fish lives a lot better though. So if you only have five baits to go fishing, I'd probably hook them in the bottom so that you can fish your baits longer. And you don't want to be reeling them in a lot because when you're doing that, you're dragging the fish backwards. You're pushing water through its gills the wrong way. So it's not going to handle that very well. But when it's hooked in the bottom and you pull it, it's gonna wanna kinda angle the fish the other way. They both work really well. 
I would start off hooking them in the top. Um, when I hook croakers in the nose, I will, I'll hook them in the nose too. It just, it just depends on the day. One thing's not going to work every time. You might see one day, for whatever reason, it's working a lot better hooking them in the nose. I go in the mouth. I don't go through the bottom of the chin. I go in the mouth, up through the nose, straight up like that. I don't go through the nostrils. I go in the mouth, out the top, uh, as opposed to going sideways like that. That is not the way I hook the croakers. I'll hook thread fins, I'll hook pilchards like that. Um, it tends to work really well. If you find that the hook, a lot of the times on those white baits, like a pilchard or a thread fin, it'll slide up to the eye and you get your hook folding over like that. Uh, not many people do it for, uh, I didn't bring any of them with me today, but not many people do it for snook fishing, but work, what works really, really well is those little uh, beads. I know owner makes them. It's uh, They're actually on one of my pompano rigs. I have one. Let's find that. So you see this little bead right here? go ahead and put that through your bait, it's going to stop your bait, if you have the right size bead, it's going to stop your bait from sliding up the shank of the hook. The bead, they stretch, so you stretch it over the over the eye or over the point of the hook, and that'll hold that bait right down there until a, a fish hits it. Once you have a lot of pressure, it'll it'll still slide. That's uh, popular popular in build fishing, using the sailfish, stuff like that, because if you're only looking for a corn fish, that can make you... Yep, yep, you can use a piece of rubber. I use the, the spear fishing bands. Just cut a, cut a little, bunch of little pieces of that off. Uh, the beads are pretty, whatever, whatever you want to do. Totally depends. Uh, in the dirty water, sometimes I'll put it right above the hook. Uh, sometimes with a, a pilchard or a thread fin or something like that, sometimes I'll put it two feet up. It just, I'll anchor him on the bottom if it's uh, rubber conditions. Uh, if it's real rough, you can even go all the way up to those big one ounce pinch weights or something like that. If I'm using a heavy, heavier the weight, I would say the further up the line I put it. So it's not all awkward there sitting on the bottom. Any uh, questions about the snook fishing? Sir. All right, now for tarpon time. That's the bonus. I don't know, any of you guys do tarpon fishing? All right. So you know how fun and frustrating it can be all at the same time. I always say I have a love-hate relationship with them. Let me get this one put away. So, you guys have a really good tarpon fishery down here when those minnows stage up. They tend to stage up here longer than they do in my area. Um, so we'll start, there's three, three different, what's that? I'm in Melbourne, so Spash in Melbourne is where I do most of my fishing. I'll tarp and fish down here sometimes, but it's a bit of a drive. Um, three different ways I fish tarp it. From the beach, no, we'll go in, we'll go in what I consider the most rewarding way. Actually, we'll go the other way. We'll do what I think is the easiest to what's the most re rewarding, or we'll call it. Um, you got fishing in the boat when you're going to go out of the inlet. You got your live wall full of bait. Everything's right with you. It's nice and easy. Um, if I'm doing something like that, casting isn't an issue. You don't need to cast very far, but you need something with power because you do not want to be putting... A two-hour fight on a tarp is ridiculous. You, I hear uh, the captains talk about how it took their, their client two hours to land a fish, and their town talk about 100 pound fish, 120, even 150 pound fish. Two hours is way too long to fight a tarp in. I mean, I got better stuff to do with two hours. You can definitely whoop you could definitely whoop 150 pound tarpon and should be like i'd say 45 minutes to an hour including getting that fish swimming again and reviving it um you want beefy tackle this is where we're going to bust out something like the 6000 salt x on either a rod like uh this is the carbon shield it's a jigging version jigging version or the the spinning the eight foot spinning rod is a sick sick rod for it really good rod this one's rated for, I don't remember, 30 to 65, and this one's up to 80, 80 pounds, I believe. Uh, but if casting is not an issue, uh, something like this is, you can put so much pressure on these fish. I still only fish 20 pound Invisibraid. I fish 20 pound Invisibraid because I have line capacity. A lot of the stuff I do is from land. 
And if I'm only fishing from the boat, I do have a reel that has 40 pound on it. I'll use that sometimes. But you're not breaking, you're very rarely gonna break 20 pound Invisibrade by putting more pressure on it than the, than the line can handle. I've tested this particular line and I got 39 pounds of, of a breaking strength from a straight pull. Now keep in mind, if a fish jumps and shakes its head, that's gonna be putting more pressure. Um, but I fish 20 pound Invisibrade. If I'm tarpon fishing, I'm always using an FG knot. It's a huge, huge difference on the test I did between uh, an FG knot and a uni knot. The 20 pound Invisibrade broke at, I think it was like 36 to 39 pounds with the FG knot. And the, the double uni knot broke at like 24 pounds. So it, same line, same leader. It's a huge, huge difference. Learn to tie the FG knot if you don't know how. Uh, Salt Strong has a really, really good instructional video on it. That's how I learned how to tie. I never, I always thought double uni all the way. And if you're looking for a quick knot to tie, if you're fishing for something, I don't know, trout or something you're not putting a ton of pressure on, you don't need an FG knot. I mean, it goes through the guides, which is really nice. You can get away with a longer leader, which is really nice. But for the tarpon, you want as much power as possible. Um, also, that really small guide, where it goes through the, or long, uh, not where it goes through the guides, is really good because if you're fishing for a tarpon, say you're looking for those big tarpon on the beach, the six, six footer plus, I say for your leader, you want your leader to be at least as long as your fish is because that fish is hooked in the nose and a lot of that fight, I mean, you, he'll take off go 100 yards, 200 yards out in the beginning, but a lot of that fight is less than 20 yards of line out and He's just swimming straight away from you and you can feel that tail hit your line, hit your line, hit your line over and over. And I use the 80 pound fluorocarbon. Sometimes I'll drop it down a little bit if it's really clear water. Um, but long leaders, you want that. A, a tarpon is not gonna fray through 80 pound fluorocarbon from its tail hitting the line. Its mouth, sure, I, don't, I mean, all that's off. Those mouths are so hard and that is probably the biggest reason for why tarpon are so hard for people to land uh, it's hard to hook them i mean there's one or two really good spots to hook a tarpon uh, i brought something to show you this is why tarpon are so hard to hook what's that no so this is from about 150 pound tarpon. Obviously there's skin and a little bit of meat around it when the fish is alive, but there ain't a whole lot. I mean, you're not getting a hook to go through here. You'll get it to pin there and you'll hold it for maybe a jump or two, but that's why they shake so many hooks. Right here where these two bones come together, that's referred to as the button. There's a nice gummy section of meat and that's where you want your hook to go. As far as how you get it there, I got certain hooks that work better than others. I have no technique for getting the hook there. Just hook as many as you can and you'll get a couple that stick. But right there's a really good spot. Uh, also, if it goes in far enough up under the jaw back here, there's a meaty section there. And then sometimes you'll get that circle hook to wedge in the corner right there. Uh, I don't like that spot though. It's, it's all bone. It comes out a lot. I mean, I've had fish right boat side and by the paddle board and that hook pops out but the hooks i like using the most are the vmc tournament series circle hooks Let's see some of you guys writing down i'll tell you what the number is on that one 7385cb and i use the seven o's the seven o's or the eight o's uh they're the same size hook the eight o's are a thicker gauge wire so if you're fishing bigger baits like uh they're in the mullet run fishing hog leg mullet or something like that you can use that 8 and it's not going to make a difference with the bait and then you can put a lot of pressure on them because uh, the 7 i bent i've definitely bent the 7 but they work really good and it takes a lot of pressure to bend them use whatever's around i mean it just depends on the time of year um when they're on the glass minnows everyone kind of focuses on a small bait i've done awesome throwing big mullet in those minnow pods and just anchoring them on the bottom uh something i do a lot of times is cut the tail off cut the tail of the mullet off i mean tarpon they'll eat stuff on the bottom they'll eat dead baits they don't you don't need this big fancy pretty bait um, i like a big bait for tarpon usually then you can 
always use the uh, the real heavy uh, heavy tackle, the heavy hook. Um, a lot of these uh, a lot of these reels. Let's take this one back out. They put out crazy amount of drag. I don't remember what the specs are, but it's like thirty or thirty five or forty pounds for a six thousand spinning reel, and it's just it. I want to get a couple people that who tarpon fishes regularly for, for big tarpon or who's who's at least caught one. Let me get two people up here. You want to come up here? We're going to show you guys a little something real quick. So this reel puts out crazy power. I'm going to have you just hold on to it. Uh, just keep stepping back. And we're just going to pull some drag out. Just, so that's going to be going out on your first run. That's going to go out for easily a minute or two minutes or so. Let me get you take it and do the same thing. Just yeah, crank it back up. So we're gonna pull it again. Just hold on to it. So it's gonna go a lot faster than I was going and it's gonna go for a long time. Now, what's your guess for how, how much pressure that is? So what that drag would be set to? Probably like 15. 15, 20. That's, that one was nine and a half or 10 pounds. And that's 20 pound braid that breaks at about 35 pounds. So people that, everyone that thinks you need 40 pound, 50 pound braid, I don't know many people that can hold on to 30 or 40 pounds of pressure other than cranking up a grouper for where the battle is won or lost in the first five seconds. So that's, uh, that's about what I fight my fish at in the beginning, that first run. I like to have the drag not super loose because I want that hook to get in there. I fish it with about 10 pounds of pressure in the beginning and it's it's all just eyeballed. I mean, when you're here, I put it on the scale so I could set it so I actually made sense when I was showing it to you. Um, but I usually fish it right around there, around 10 pounds of pressure for the hookup and it lets them run. It's not crazy strong pressure. You're probably not going to pop them off. I mean, I'd be really surprised if they broke your braid or your leader from, from just 10, 10 and a half pounds of pressure. Um, but if you try fighting a fish with that much pressure the whole fight, it's it's not going to go very well for the tarpon. And that's how that, that's how I got those jaws. Uh, every year if you fish on the beach, you will find a dead tarpon washed up, probably from an angler that fought it too hard, or maybe they got shark. But this was a whole dead tarpon that washed up, and you could see the markings all over its head where the line was rubbing on it while it was fighting. So I don't know what happened with it. I think that it fought and it wasn't revived properly or fought too long and they just couldn't save it. Um, but you need to jump, you could double that and double that amount of pressure and it's gonna be what you really wanna do on a tournament. I would say, let them do those crazy runs, get it out in the beginning, uh, all those jumps, all that craziness and then really start to put the heat to them, especially when they get both sides. They're gonna just keep rolling. They're gonna roll for more than half the fight. They'll be right off the bow of your boat. And unless you really, I call it breaking their spear. You get them to roll once, you, you get them to do a full backflip when, they, when they're just swimming there. If you can turn them, it, it changes the whole fight like instantly. So that's, if you fish on the boat, I would say put an insane amount of pressure on the fish. And then you're not wasting your whole day. A lot of times with the tarpon, it's a morning evening bite. So if you spend two hours fighting a fish or an hour and a half fighting a fish, you got one shot at it for the day. If you can win or lose that fight and, and, and if you prey them off, who cares? I mean, the best part of a tarpon fight is the beginning anyways, unless you're looking for a picture. I mean, the rest of the fight pretty much sucks. It's just a heavy, strong, slow pull. Um, the other way I really like to do, and I've seen a lot of people do it down here too, is the paddleboard, paddle boards and kayaks. I think it's 10 times easier to hook the fish on the, if you're on the fish, I mean, the boat has its advantage that you can chase them up and down the beach, you can look for a good school. But if you find the school from A1A and you've got your kayak or your paddle board, they're not afraid of you. I mean, you can, I've had the fish swim right under me. I've had them eat five feet off my paddle board, trolling behind it. Um, all the same tactics go in, go in right there. Does anyone here kayak fish or paddleboard fish? All right, so, okay. The only thing I'll tell you then, it's fun, try it. I mean, not many people, we got people online too. If you, I'll go over it real quick since we got people online also. Uh, paddleboard fishing, I slow troll baits is the most common way I do it. Unless they're blowing up, then I'll cast into them. Uh, couple of tips I have for the paddleboard fishing, because it's hard to put pressure on a fish. It's really hard, because you can move a paddleboard with one pound of pressure and you're going to start moving. Uh, I always bring an anchor now. 
It stops you from getting dragged way offshore and lets you put a lot more pressure on the fish. Also, fight the fish off the side of your paddleboard, off the side of your kayak, because your kayak doesn't want to go that way. So if you keep the fish on the side, you can put a lot more pressure also. And fish with someone. You got a buddy with you, it makes it a lot easier to help fight and land those fish. Uh, now what about from the beach? Who does it from the beach? So running the beach can be a really, really good thing. It's a little early in the year now. Uh, I think the pogies just left here. I just saw them up by my house yesterday for the first time. I know the pogies were down here on the beach, but uh, right now there's pogies on the beach by us. I don't know what you guys have down here, but coming up pretty soon, you're gonna start to get the glass minnows. That'll be more like end of the spring, summertime. And that is an awesome time to get on tarpon. If you ever want to target tarpon, uh, the glass minnow run, it's insane. It's fun because even if you don't catch one, you just stared at a school of tarpon doing cartwheels every two seconds for the whole sunrise. It's just, it's beautiful. I mean, these fish are so powerful and just watching them blow up the glass minnows is so fun and also so frustrating because you feel yourself throwing. You might cast a hundred times and not hook a fish. I think a lot of it has to do with there's just so much bait in the water. I mean, it, it, that your lure has to go right past that fish's face to get them. And I say lure because you're normally fishing lures because we're normally moving. The, it's a constant walk when we're uh, fishing the glass minnow pond on the beach. Uh, I'm fishing all those same lures that I fished for the snook, the swim baits, the mag darters, the uh, hydra minnows, the swim shad, stuff like that. There's one other lure I throw that I find not many people throwing, and I think it's a really, really underrated lure. Works awesome with the glass minnows. There's lots of glass minnow lures out there. Little teeny swim baits or uh, little uh, designed like for mackerel and stuff. But they have super small hooks. You can't put any pressure. But the, the number one and two Clark spoons have a really beefy hook in it. And I get the, I actually use the squid spoon. I don't use the regular Clark spoon. The squid spoon has a welded eye. Uh, if you're gonna be going for the tarpon, I mean, that's a very small profile bait. Yeah, it's about the size of those glass minnows, maybe a little bit bigger. It casts really well for how light it is. And it's a you can do a very slow retrieval with it so you can kind of hang it in there for a little longer where the tarpon are actually feeding compared to something like a two ounce hoagie or something that you, you let it sit for too long and just be laying on the bottom. Uh, this type of fishery is where I want to be able to cast far, especially with something light like this. So. I use the Salt X Surf Rods. This is the 12 footer. Uh, I have a nine and a half to 12 footer is what I use just depending on how far out the fish are. Uh, crazy, crazy amount of power uh, in something like this. You can still do all your pompano fishing with something like this, but it is it has a lot more power than uh, those other rods I was showing you before, like the Air Waves or the Trophy 2s. And then same reel that we showed you as the black one is the Salt X 6000. 20 pound Invisibrade, I'm still fishing 80 pound leader. Uh, again, sometimes I'll drop it down a little bit, but those, uh, those swim baits, it's just really light. So you're casting over and over and over. You do it for two or three days, you're having fun, you're not thinking about it, and you're trying to figure out why your shoulder hurts so bad. It's not from fighting fish, it's from casting, like literally 250 times a morning, just looking for that one, then you get a bump and you miss it. Or you get a jump, and that was what you fished for the whole morning, was one jump. But every now and then you get that one to stick and on the beach, same thing. I mean, you can you can put a ton of pressure on them on the beach because they can't pull you. They're not, you're limited to the beach. You can't go anywhere. Uh, and that's why I really like that 20 pound. As I showed you, the breaking strength is well over 35 pounds. Or I'd say 35 to 40 pounds of the breaking strength. And let them run in the beginning. Let them go run crazy far out but then crank it on and put the heat to them. The 6,000 Salt X, I think it does 540 yards of 20 pound. That's a, I use the Invisibrade, that's what I like. Uh, but 540 yards, I've never gotten spooled. We almost got spooled once, and then we found out it was a snag fish, snagged in the back, and it's, you can't turn them. It's, it's horrible if that happens. It's so hard to stop those fish. But uh, I've never had a, a tarpon spool me with something like this. You can, I've always been able to stop them. Uh, live bait's a lot of fun too from the beach. I hook a, hook the mullet. I, I like using mullet because they swim up top and uh, it seems to get a really good uh, really good 
reaction bite out of the tarpon when it swims across them. And a lot of the times the tarpon down here, they seem to be really close on the glass minnows. So I guess casting is not a huge issue. But if they are further out, uh, get a, some big old mullet if you can find them in a creek or just on the, one of the docks or something where you live. You can get some like six, seven, eight, nine inch mullet, those big old circle hooks that I was using, and hook them in the back, either top or bottom, but barely hook them, just enough to be able to cast them. You want as much hook as exposed as possible. And you don't need to cast them far. If there's no waves, just barely flip them out and do that technique where you keep your bail up and you keep pressure on them. But if you keep pressure on them, they're going to keep swimming away from you 90% of the time. Sometimes the mullet just wants to come back in and I just get rid of them. Take them off the hook because that's what he wants to do. Put a new mullet on that wants to swim out. So if they're swimming out, you can keep feet in line until they get to where the tarpon are. And then you can kind of hold them right there. And it's just, it's my favorite fishery. That tarpon on the beach are, it's, if you've ever caught them on the boat, you know how fun it is. Catching them on the beach is ten times more rewarding than catching them on a boat. It's just that much better. Uh, any questions on the tarpon fishing? No, no, I definitely don't use this. Question was on the paddleboard or kayak, what rod and reel. Uh, same thing you use on the boat. Because you don't need to cast far. You can go to where the fish are or you can troll or however you're doing it. And yeah, because if you have a long rod, even the, even uh, on the boat, uh, if you're by yourself, it's hard to land a fish. You want something like in the seven and a half to eight foot range, because there's no way you can reach a fish at the end of this rod. Uh, you get the leader though on those fish and that 80 pound, you can hold that 80 pound. If you wrap it, and don't wrap it on your fingers, but if that fish is tired, if you wrap it on your hand, that 80 pounds, most I, I've never been cut by it. If, it. if I wrap it on my hand, I've popped hooks off before but I don't think you can get cut by the 80 pound on a fish that's pretty worn out. You're either going to turn him and he's going to come in, or he's going to pop the hook off and, or bend the hook or something like that. Uh, anyone do any jetty fishing here? Fishing the inlets or Sebastian or Fort Pierce or here? Um, if you watch my channel, I do a lot of the jetty fishing. I like Sebastian Inlet a lot. That's one of the areas I fish. Um, I like jetty fishing because it's my favorite thing to do and there's nothing else to do. You could go out there on a day like today and you could go catch fish because it doesn't matter how rough it is, you're already going to be put out to where all the fish are hiding. Um, jetty fishing, there's a couple different setups I like to do, it just kind of depends on the day. Over the last, I'd say, two years, I've really dropped down the size gear I use on the jetties and pretty much just like the beach, just for fun. I mean, I fish these little two and three thousand size reels on these little seven and a half foot uh, fast action rods. This is a, uh, I think I said it before, eight to 15, I think it is. Yeah, eight to 15, 10 pound braid, 30 pound, usually 30 pound leader, sometimes 40. Uh, and that's for the redfish, for the snook, uh, not tarpon, you don't fish this for tarpon. It's not gonna work out very well for you. Um, but the jetty fishing is a lot of fun. When I fish the jetties, I, I don't do the nighttime fishing. I mean, this is pretty late for me right here. It's dark, I'm supposed to be home already. So I don't do the jig fishing, I don't do any of that. But uh, if you like live bait fishing, the jetties can be a lot of fun, but it comes with a very steep learning curve. And the steep learning curve is gonna cost you tackle. That's what it is. I mean, there's just so many rocks. You gotta learn the tides, you gotta learn the currents. But I think it is the easiest place to catch quality and quantity of fish. I mean, you go out and you go fish a shoreline and catch a couple big snook in a day, you're probably pretty happy. It was probably a pretty good day if you caught a couple, say, upper slot to 35, 36 in fish. You can easily catch 10, 10 fish that size on the jetty in a session because you're fishing a school of might be 100 or 200 fish that are just staged up there waiting for food. Uh, so it, it's it's a really good fishery, or a really good fishery to, to get good at. Put the time in, learn it. Um, again, I can't I can't speak for Fort Pierce or for Stewart because I don't do too much fishing in those inlets. But uh, Sebastian, I'd say, gets the rep of being a pretty rough place as far as crowds go. And I think it's because it, it just looks really overwhelming when you see that many people fishing that close together. Um, but the majority of the people out there are really cool. They'll work together, they'll help each other. And if you show respect, you get respect. It's that sort of deal. I mean, I never bring a landing net up there and I have no problem having someone net my fish. At the same time though, when that person hooks up, they can't net their own fish, so go help them out. Uh, if, 
you want to learn how to jetty fish, it, all your weights, all your hooks, everything, all your bait is going to change seasonally. Uh, even throughout the tide, you might start with a, even a three line bait, and then by the time that tide's moving, you might bump all the way up to a two ounce. That's a huge difference to be fishing all the same year, but to go from a three line to a two ounce in one fishing session in an hour or so. Four to five ounces? Yeah. Yeah, you can go, you can use, yeah. Yeah, I like to put just enough weight on to where you're making contact at the bottom. I don't really anchor my baits there. If I'm fishing for a uh, snook, I want my bait to be able to float through the current like it normally would. Uh, at least in Sebastian, you put a five ounce weight in that channel, it's gonna last about a minute before it ends up in the rock. Now, if you're fishing off the end, you're going far out, heavy leads definitely, uh, definitely can be good. Uh, but make friends up there. Watch what people are using, talk to people, learn what they're using, and uh, especially in the Sebastian area, I mean, talk to the, talk to the locals. That's gonna really help you out if you're doing trips up there. Um, any other subjects you guys want to be watching in my stuff? Braided line. Um, I go with Invisibraid and it was something that was recommended to me. Just a lot of the people that I fish the jetties with use Invisibraid. I don't know if they were the first ones to have white line, but they're definitely the, the, the most common one I see around, at least around me. Uh, if you're fishing a crowded area like the jetty, don't go up there with dark green line because no one's going to see it. It's gonna, you're going to get tangled a lot more. Use white line or yellow line or something light blue, something easy to see. Um, I like the Invisibraid because of the breaking, breaking strength on the 20 pound. Other than that, I don't really have that much of a preference on braided line. Um, the, I really like the 20 pound Invisibraid because like I said, it breaks at around 40 pounds. And then if you bump up to 30 pound Invisibraid, it might break at 42 pounds. Like there isn't a whole lot, but you can get a lot more castability with a lighter line. Um, but braid isn't always the best. I mean, it casts the furthest, it definitely casts the furthest, but uh, depending on what you're doing, braid's not the best. If you're a boat fisherman and you don't need to cast far, like when I fish the boat a lot of time, I use mono. I use 30 pound mono. That 30 pound mono is gonna get dragged through the rocks and it's, it's gonna shape up where braid is just gonna cut. Um, that's why you see people uh, doing the grouper fishing or the mutton fishing or something like that, a fish that's getting the rocks. A lot of times they'll put really, really long leaders just so the fish doesn't see the, the line as well. But those mono leader or mono line can really help you out when you're dealing with the jetties and the pilings and the rocks and pulling fish out. Um, even when I fish braid, especially on the 10 pound rod, because I have no control over a fish on 10 pound line. Uh, you're just basically tiring the fish out. Like a, a 35 inch snook, because I film everything on the GoPro, so I see times. A 35 inch snook usually runs for about four, four and a half minutes if you fight them really light. On a 10 pound test, that's what you got to do. So I'll put an FG knot, because it goes to the guides, and I'll put a 10 foot long 30 pound fluorocarbon leader. That way I have some, because they're normally not some like through rocks, it's normally just your line brushing against them. So if you have that 30 pound fluorocarbon leader, even with a light line like 10 pound braid, that 30 pound can normally rub on the rocks enough to keep the braid out of it. Uh, and now they run through a rock or through a dead line, as soon as that braid touches it, you're probably done. Yeah. I got a question. With the light braid, I don't get too many wind knots. I think that's something you kind of got to train yourself to not reel slack. When I cast out before I start reeling, I'll almost always just grab the line with my finger and hold it and then do a couple cranks until you get your leg tight. Uh, if I'm casting against the wind and, and reeling in a lot, that's when I'll get wind knots. But if you can keep tension on your reel, uh, I don't really get the wind knots. And, I mean, look down at it in between casts and you see that little loop sticking up, then you know you need to, you need to address that because before you get tangled. The question was, dealing with wind not to break. I forgot to repeat the question for the online people. Yeah. yeah, live bait from the jetties. I would say the, if I could only pick one bait and I was going in blind, like I didn't know what they were eating that day, uh, my favorite bait to fish on jetties is live shrimp. 
Um, I like, usually like fishing the bigger shrimp. I hook them in the head, like right under the horn. Fish very lightweight, the light amount, of, light amount of weight as possible. And just some kind of, I don't remember the brand on these hooks, but just some kind of little, uh, that's, not, that's the big one. This little teeny, teeny, teeny J hook. It's a 1-0 J hook. I think it's the Mustad O'Shaughnessy or something like that. But that little teeny J hook, you can put enough pressure on, especially if you're only fishing 10 pound braid or something. You're not putting a lot of pressure on the fish. And that little hook lets that shrimp swim. And those shrimp are strong. You, you, put a, you put the right hook in the right, right weight or light enough weight and keep that bait looking natural be a lot better off doing that than putting something like a four or five o circle hook or something in there. I use the little J hooks and even when I'm doing catch and release on the snook I'll use that J hook and maybe going at it 20 times the hook fish will get hooked a little deep but I would say I have just as good of a hook in the flight mouth three as I do a circle hook on that. How much weight on the live shrimp? Uh, when I it just, it really depends. I use the little pinch weights. Start off with something really small, just basically the size of a BB. Uh, we have a lot of seagull problems, so that's kind of the big thing right now, fishing Sebastian. I've been fishing shrimp a lot lately. Um, and this, if you don't get the bait down, the seagulls are on it. It says orange, the turns, those orange, orange deep turns. And, they'll dive down and they'll wreck you on that. But other than that, I mean, as, as light as you can, as light as you can to be able to get down. Uh, I usually put it up a pretty good weight. With shrimp, I like to keep the weight away from the bait, usually between a foot and two. Anything else on the jetty fish? Yeah. Have you ever you've never done it before? No. Okay, so get, question was catching sand fleas um, and secret techniques on sand fleas. Not really any secret techniques. Get them when they're there. That's the biggest thing. Uh, keep going to the beach. Uh, if, when it's cold, they go down deeper usually. They might be there, but they might be a foot or two feet under under the ground. But if it's warm, they'll usually come up and they're, they're tide driven a lot of times. And it's not like they're always there on high tide or always there on low tide or mid tide or incoming tide or outgoing tide. But you can usually pattern them. If you talk to someone that tells you sand fleas are at such and such beach at noon, as long as there wasn't a super big change in the weather, they should be there at the same time the next day. They don't move around very much as far as changing locations. But if it gets cold, they will go down. Um, and when you get them, uh, have you ever seen a sand flea rake? Do you know what those are? There you go. So we got the, we got the little sand flea rake. The little sand flea rake right here. And when the sand fleas are up top, you're looking for, uh, it looks like little V's in the sand. It, a good way to see what it looks like is take a shell or a rock and as the water recedes when there's very little water just cross that rock there and look at the pattern it makes as the water moves by it that's what the sand fleas will look like but there'll be a whole school of them uh, I like to time it so I look at the sand fleas and they'll they will hear your footsteps if you're coming up close to them and you spot them back up the beach they're gonna stay right there it might take five minutes or a minute or two or three minutes for them to come back up but back up the beach and wait for them to pop back up real high if they're down deep Hard. But once they get comfortable and they're up real high on the sand, you can see, see them real well, wait for a wave to come in, and then as the wave's coming in, you're going to go on the far side of them, and I don't dig down deep. If they're up top, keep it just right there, and as the wave rushes back, they're going to start shooting, they're, they're going to start swimming back with the water, and I just scrape the surface, and then, I mean, when they're around, one scoop of this would be plenty to fish for the whole day, even with a little rake this size. Um, but when they're around really good, do that blanching process. Load up on them and get, get a gallon of them. A gallon of fleas probably fill up maybe like five uh, little Ziploc bags and boil, bring water to a boil, like uh, just regular water with salt. Water back. So the wave, I'm facing the waves. I'm going to go like this and bring back. So that's the, that's, it, it all just depends where they are. It's, 
you got to kind of get them when they're around. And I don't put too much effort in. If, if, if I can't find fleas, I'm already stocked up because I freeze them. So bring the water to, if you do get on any good numbers of them, uh, bring, a water, bring water to a boil uh, with some salt in there. Put the sand fleas in there just long enough for them to turn orange. They turn orange just like when you cook shrimp. Uh, and it smells like you're cooking shrimp. That's what it smells like. It doesn't stink up your house or anything like that. It smells like you just cooked some shrimp or crab. They're not bad at all. Um, bring it, once they're boiling, I mean, it may, may take 20, 30 seconds, and then take them out. You can either put them in an ice bath or just bag them up. I put them in Ziploc bags, let them cool for a little bit, and then put them in the freezer. And it makes them bright orange too. I think they, I think they like the color of it a lot. And that is a phenomenal sheep's head bait as well. So just like people use filler crabs are real good. Sometimes filler crabs are hard to come by. Uh, sand fleas work really, really well, whether you're fishing the reefs, like the patch reefs right out in the ocean, or fishing docks or pilings. Uh, sand fleas are really, really good. And if you do get into the sand fleas where you can get a crazy number of sand fleas, you start chumming with sand fleas and you're gonna get those sheep's head to be real dumb. And that is a lot of fun. I mean. Sheep's head, sheep's head fish, I think, is one of the most underrated fisheries in the area. I mean, not a ton of people do it. I, I don't think a ton of people do it. Um, but this year, I've seen a lot more people sheep's head fishing. At least by me, the bait shops are always blowing through sand fleas. It's not really for pompano, because we had a really good pompano run this year. It lasted about a week, and I don't know what happened. But sand, the sheep's head fishing has been really, really good. Yeah, as the water starts receding, just asking about the sand fleas again, uh, when, when the water is receding, that's when I put the, when I can see them, I put the rake between, uh, or on the, we'll say on the east side, on the east side of the school sand fleas. Sometimes they're deep, if they're deep, you gotta push that rake down, scoop up a bunch of sand, and pull it right up. If they're real shallow, just the whole time that wave's rushing by, just slowly pull it across the school, and they're gonna swim into the into the rake. And instead of getting a bunch of sand, you're getting just fleas. And I mean, you could probably fill this rake halfway up with just fleas, as opposed to when you're scooping sand. Then the rake's full of sand plus some fleas. So it's 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 really one of those things you got to get out there and do it. It's it's not hard to do. You're gonna. But, but from the beginning, from your first scoop to your tenth scoop, you're going to be like a thousand percent better and have more of an understanding. But you just got to try it. Yes. Um, I wouldn't say I have a preference between the two. I know they both work really well. Uh, it depends what you're using it for. If you're using it for for pompano fishing. Um, I mean, they, they both work really good. The, the fish gum has like a fabric in there. You see like when the, once the fish gum wears off your hook and it, it leaves behind that fabric, it stays on the hook a little better. Uh, the fish gum, it's a softer, I, th I think the fish gum is more potent when it comes to smells and stuff like that. Uh, but they, they both work really well. And then I would say it's almost, I like it for the color. So if I want, I like or orange is my favorite color, whether it's the clam, the shrimp or the sand flea. I like one of the orange artificial days or fake days stuff. Uh, I got a few of them up here if you wanted to look at them. It's the, I brought the sand flea. And then uh, I just got a couple different colors, the yellow, green, and orange, but they all work really well. Cut them into about one inch long strips, put the hook through one end, fold it over, put it through the, the other end, so you're kind of double hooking it on there. Um, it works for a lot more than just the pompano though. I use it. I use it offshore if you guys do any kind of reef fishing, especially if you get into, I don't know if you guys get vermilion snapper and stuff like that here, but or if you do any kind of uh, deep dropping or anything like that. Uh, anyone go to the Bahamas and do like a yellow eye fishing or something. It's cool, cool bait to use for stuff you wouldn't normally think to use it for. Uh, let's see, let's see if I'm forgetting anything. We'll go over jigs. I use a couple different jigs, just like little jig heads with sand fleas. Okay. Uh, these are the bottom scooper jigs that any kind of little jig head. Uh, drop that down. Thank you. Uh, hook a sand flea on there and bring those sand fleas out to the reef. You'll catch all sorts of stuff. I've caught keeper mutton snapper, I've caught everything on sand fleas from 
redfish trout at Sebastian Inlet. I mean, I know there's a lot of stuff around certain times. I've seen snook caught on sand fleas. Uh, probably once a year, I'd say, while pompano fishing, I'll catch a snook. And I don't know if I'm catching them on the sand flea or if I caught a croaker and didn't notice it and caught the snook on the croaker. So I don't know which way it happens, but the jigs with sand fleas can be a really, really productive fishing technique also. Look at these. I'll go over the rest of the rods and reels that I use, mostly for the for the surf. Um, the Salt X that I have, the 6000. That's my go-to. Like if I need something with a lot of power, uh, it's a really good reel, completely sealed. You can dunk it in the surf. That's why it's my. If I'm going paddleboard fishing or surf fishing, you're not going to land a tarpon in the surf or from the paddleboard without getting your reel wet. Like it's just going to happen. So something like that's a really good investment if you're looking to do uh, kind of like some hardcore fishing where you're going to be getting it soaked and stuff a lot. Uh, it, what's that? This is the Tsunami Salt X. Yeah, Tsunami Salt X. And you're welcome to come check it out afterwards. Uh, if uh, that real, I think that real price is right around 340 or 350 something like that. Uh, another reel I really like to use are the Shields. I mean, the shield is a, it's a much less expensive reel. It's, it is sealed. It's not as sealed as the Salt X is going to be. Uh, but it's still a really good reel. Not everyone has the budget for a 300 and something dollar reel. And if you don't, nothing wrong with that. Get something more like, it's a, around a $120 reel or so. Uh, same thing works really well. Even if you're, I fish in the surf all summer, or all winter long confident fishing for the ones I have now, this is their second year and not a single issue. So. I wouldn't purposely be dunking it, where when I'm using the Salt X, I don't care at all. I dunk that thing like crazy. But something like that's a really good setup too. And they go from size, I think, 3,000 all the way up to eight. And then the Salt X is a four and a six. So between the four and the six, pretty much covers, I'd say most of your normal fishing around here. If you're doing a lot more inshore stuff, uh, there's, the shield, there's also the Evict is a is a real light one if you guys do inshore stuff for like trout and redfish and snook and stuff like that. The little two and three thousands are a really comfortable reel to throw. And I know that they got a bunch of them inside. I think they put a bunch of the combos uh, together just like the combos I have set up out here. So if you want to check them out, check them out here. They got them inside also. So anything else? Any other questions? When you're fishing artificials with the glass minnows around, yeah. where do you cast? Do you cast in the middle, on the edges, try so to go below them? Questions of when fishing the glass minnow pods for tarpon or snook also, uh, where are you casting? You'll know where you're casting because you're most likely going to be seeing those fish come flying out of the water. Uh, if the fish are mostly close to shore, sometimes it'll be 100 yards and they're just blowing up that whole 100 yards right on the shore. I'll cast completely sideways to the shore, like almost oh, just right down that trough. Then you're not casting as much. If you're throwing straight out, you might only be casting 30 feet and then reeling it in and casting again and again and again. Or if you cast sideways, you cast 70 yards and then you just got that whole long retrieve all the way through the school of fish. Um, I will say one thing with the tarpon on the swim baits, uh, that bony mouth we talked about. I do fish with swim baits. I fish a, or artificial. I fish a much stronger drag on hook set, probably in like the 15 to 20 pound of drag uh, range. And when I set that hook, I set that hook hard and I set that hook low. I I usually reel sideways, and I will set the hook as hard as I can, and I'm like almost jogging backwards. And I'll give them like two or three real good hook sets. And all I'm trying to do is keep enough pressure, because you got no shot of knowing where that hook is, but I want to keep enough pressure so if it's in a bone, if I'm hooked right here, as that fish starts moving, I want to have enough pressure to keep that hook pinned to that bone until it slides somewhere it can stick. If you just do one quick hook set and that fish shakes its head and it's in bone, it's just going to throw it right out of the mouth every time. But if you put an insane amount of pressure, and I do rod tip low. People have different preferences. I rod tip low and pull as hard as you can. Uh, and then once they start running, people say you bow to them when they jump. I do fight up and down and uh, usually put the rod in my hip just kind of really saves you if you're, you're going to be
be in at least a 30 minute battle on a big fish. Uh, I do bow to them. I do stick the rod, especially in the beginning of the fight. Um, towards the end of the fight though, they're much weaker jumps. I don't think it matters as much, especially fishing these 10, 12 foot rods. That rod, when it's bent, I mean, it has so much play in it. I mean, it's gonna move four feet just from the flexibility of the rod. Um, can't think of anything I'm missing on the carbon fishing. Uh, for all of it though, the biggest thing is networking. Everyone, everyone posts stuff online, you see all that, but you gotta get that, get that crew of friends. I have probably five or six friends up tarpon fish, uh, and I only talk to them in the summertime. Some of these guys, I don't, I'm not even really friends with them, we just tarpon fish together. I mean, we're good friends when it comes time to tarpon, and we'll be going up and down A1A with our trucks and looking for the schools of bait and checking every other meet. One person starts in the north, one person starts in the south, and work together. I mean, especially if, you, if you're willing to drive for it, if you're willing to drive up to Melbourne or you're willing, willing to drive to Sebastian to look for them, uh, there's a lot of people that are willing to trade information. You just got to be willing to call them when you find them in your backyard. So that's, that's the biggest thing is finding the fish. Finding the fish before Facebook finds the fish, basically. Or before my YouTube shows it on there. Uh, oh, I brought one other thing. A lot of people are always asking me about the YouTube stuff. This is all I film with. It's just a hat. Super simple. The GoPro is all you do. It's, uh, it's on your head, so you just hit a button and just keep fishing. It's on, it's recording, you don't do anything else that you want to turn it off and just hit the button again. They're really simple, they're a lot of fun. If, whether you want to post stuff or you just want to have the video for yourself to have, I use those a lot. And then this is the bag I usually have with me. Uh, just like spare batteries and another, usually another camera. I don't use a cart. Um, I can carry everything I have. I can carry it in two trips. And I just, I don't have the room for a cart. I live in a condo. I just don't have the room for a cart. Otherwise, I'd have one. There's some really, really cool carts. There's a Facebook page called um, Florida Surf Fishing Carts or something like that. And you start with the cart you buy here. That's your base. Like the cart that they have for sale at your tackle store. And then there's crazy i mean there's some really talented welders in the surf fishing community because they make some really cool stuff uh, anything from fully customized sand spikes uh, to stuff on their carts uh, pompano fishing uh what a lot of people use uh it's a speed game you might not be getting anything i'm sorry i'm bouncing around and i just keep thinking of things uh, the pompano fishing the speed thing you might not be getting any bites and then a school comes through a school comes through and you got to move fast when that school's there because if you take catch that fish, you reel it in, you're looking at it, you're doing all this stuff. If it takes you 10 minutes to get a rod back out, that school might be gone. But if you can, I usually unhook the fish, throw it in a bucket, pull, pull some sand fleas out. I keep them in my pocket, throw some sand fleas on the hook, get it right back out there. So I'm casting my bait out before I do anything else. Because while I'm waiting for the next fish, then I can deal with the fish I just caught, assuming it's a keeper. If it's a little undersized fish, you don't want it to be sitting up in the sand, throw it back in the water. But uh, a lot of people use the uh, aprons, like that, uh, that, like basically the guys at Home Depot or the girls that work, everyone that works at Home Depot, they have the apron with the pockets in the front. You can keep a couple of rigs in there, you can keep your flyers, you can keep your bait, you can keep your fish bites, and I see a lot of people using those for surf fishing. I just keep sand in my pocket. Anything else? Do we have anything online? We're all good? Any other questions? Oh, you're welcome. Thank you all for joining us here. Another beautiful night for a seminar. Nice, cold, and windy. I know you guys are loving it. We appreciate y'all hanging out. We appreciate your questions. Thank you to everyone who tuned in online. Do us a favor. Go check out Joey's YouTube page. He creates some awesome content, and we're so glad to have him here to teach you guys a couple of things. Also, inside the shop, all these combos that he was talking about, we've got them for sale. Um, they're going to be marked down at a discounted, at a discounted price been pretty tough to get this time of year with everything that's going on but we've got it here come check it out and stay tuned to our social media accounts facebook and instagram and even inside the shop for our february seminar schedule coming out here shortly thank you guys have a good night Thanks. i got one more thing to say